Impossible is a mindset. What is impossible today becomes possible tomorrow, so impossible things happen all the time. We didn't think stars could be made of different elements from Earth, or that helium existed, or that white holes were possible until someone studied those phenomena and documented the evidence. So here are three discoveries made in spite of the fact that what they found wasn't just unheard of, it had previously been considered impossible. For one, we only know what stars are made of because people published research findings that others said were ridiculous. Here's Caitlin to tell us about Cecilia Payne Gaposchkin's impossible discovery. Cecilia Payne was born in England in 1900, not a time when women were welcome in the world of science. But she was smart and passionate and pursued her true love, astronomy. In 1923, Payne emigrated to the U.S. to study at Radcliffe College, now Harvard College Observatory, one of the only academic institutions at the time that accepted female students in the discipline of physics. And in just two years, she became the first person to earn a Ph.D. at the college with what's been called the most brilliant thesis ever written in astronomy. In it, 23-year-old Payne laid the groundwork for basically every everything we know about the stars. And for the first time, she corrected our assumption that the whole universe shares Earth's elemental makeup. Before pain, everyone assumed that the stars were made of basically the same hundred or so elements found on Earth. It stood to reason at the time that the stuff we know here must be the same as the stuff out there. But once we started to use spectrographs, tools that allow us to read the elements in the stars, the universe started to look confusing. Spectrography was first developed in the late 19th century, when scientists realized that if they passed light through a medium like a gas and broke it into a spectrum, certain wavelengths of color would be missing from that spectrum. After doing this enough, they were able to tell which elements absorbed which wavelengths, and the science of spectrography was born. This was clearly useful for observing the elements in the atmospheres of stars, a medium that lay between us and the constant source of starlight. And it appeared that the stars tended to have all the same elements as Earth, in more or less the same proportions. But soon, a weird pattern emerged. The spectra from all known stars consistently formed seven different absorption sequences. This seemed to suggest that there were seven kinds of stars, each composed of the same hundred odd elements as Earth, but with some slight variations. But why would there only be seven different types of stars when there are more than a million possible combinations of those hundred or so elements? It just didn't add up, and no one had a good explanation. But Payne suspected that we were looking at the problem in the wrong way. She hypothesized the seven spectrum patterns we were seeing weren't the result of different combinations of elements but they were created by seven different temperature ranges. How could that be? Well, in matter, atoms are normally swarming around each other and colliding. The higher the temperature is, the more atoms move around and the more collisions there are. And in really exceedingly high temperatures, sometimes atoms can collide so fast that one of their electrons will essentially break off, creating an ion of that atom. So for example, if an atom of helium, which typically has two electrons, is in one of these high temperature mosh pits and it loses one of its electrons, it'll turn into a helium ion. So now, because they have new, slightly different chemical signatures, these ions absorb different wavelengths of light than their parent electrons. Elements do. Payne hypothesized that since hotter temperatures mean more ionization, that could explain the different absorption patterns that astronomers were finding. But then the question was, ions of what? She went about determining which ions could create those mysterious absorption patterns, and at what temperature range they could each exist. That could have taken forever, because Payne was dealing with not just that original hundred-odd elements, but also countless variations of each. But as soon as she began studying ions of hydrogen, everything fell into place. The seven different spectrograph patterns created by starlight perfectly corresponded to those made by seven groups of hydrogen ions, each of which could only exist in its own temperature range. After identifying those groups, Payne was able to study other ions that could also exist at those temperatures and determine which ones could make the spectral patterns that everyone was seeing. The thing was, most of what could be found in those lines were ions of helium, but not much else. For the first time, it was clear that the stars were not made of the same elements as Earth, but overwhelmingly of just the two lightest elements hydrogen and helium. Hydrogen, Payne realized, was about one million times more abundant than any other element in the stars. And from this new understanding, scientists were able to form all sorts of new theories that address some of the biggest issues in the cosmos. Like that the universe was originally made of hydrogen, and then the stars created heavier atoms by fusing hydrogen atoms together and the heavier elements that followed. Payne's research made it possible to read the histories of stars by knowing not only their chemical makeup, but their temperatures and densities too. Still, it was 1925, and Cecilia Payne was a woman. Her advisor urged her not to publish her findings in her thesis because they were too controversial, 
one professor said they were clearly impossible. Regrettably, she took their advice. But then a few years later, her advisor published the same results that Payne first discovered and presented to him, and is still sometimes credited with her work to this day. That's why we're doing this episode about her. Payne eventually became Payne Kapashkin and spent most of her life working as a technical assistant at Harvard. She taught a full course load, and many of her students went on to have prominent careers in astronomy. For decades, she continued to pursue research into the evolution of stars, as well as other exotic bodies like pulsars. And in time, she did publish her revolutionary findings in a book called Stellar Atmospheres, which convinced many of her colleagues not only what stars are made of, but that she was the one who had figured it out. Finally, in 1956, more than 30 years after her discovery, and despite the grumblings of her former advisor, she became the chair of the astronomy department at Harvard. She broke the field of astronomy's glass ceiling, for which I will forever be grateful. Sometimes, even after something like the elemental makeup of stars has been discovered, people can't wrap their minds around it for another few decades. But now we know that Cecilia payne Kapashkin was right. And just like it took decades to acknowledge Payne for that discovery, it was decades after the element helium was discovered before it was accepted as a part of the periodic table. Here's how that impossible element was discovered, as explained by Reed. We've known about all the naturally occurring elements for at least 80 years, from the familiar ones like iron and carbon to the very last one we found, francium. Most of these elements were discovered by doing clever chemistry, but the second most abundant element in the universe also has one of the most unique stories. Helium was discovered in space before it was found on Earth. And it took nearly three decades for scientists to accept that it could actually exist. The now famous balloon filler and squeaky voice maker was first discovered in the atmosphere of the sun back in the 1860s. Around the same time, Russian chemist Dmitry Mendeleev was making what would soon become the standard periodic table by categorizing the known elements by their chemical properties. He even left gaps in his table for elements he predicted would be discovered someday. But Mendeleev's table didn't include the group of elements we now call the noble gases, or even a gap for them, because no one had ever seen one. Helium is one of these noble gases, elements that are incredibly unreactive. It's a struggle to do any chemistry with them at all, making them hard to detect. It doesn't help that Earth's atmosphere is only about five parts per million helium either. But in space, it's different. If you could look at the universe as a whole, you would find that 75% of it is hydrogen and 25% is helium, and everything else is negligible. The sun's composition is similar. So how can you detect an unknown element that doesn't react with anything and basically only exists in space in the 19th century? The answer lies in a technique called spectroscopy. If you put sunlight through a prism, you get a spectrum of light, with the visible part showing up as a rainbow. In 1815, a German physicist named Joseph von Fraunhofer discovered something unexpected. The spectrum had holes in it. Fraunhofer had seen dark lines at very precise points in the spectrum that looked kind of like a barcode. These lines only appeared in sunlight, so they also acted like a barcode. You could distinguish sunlight from other types of light by looking at the spectrum. Fraunhofer labeled these lines A, B, C, and so on. And 50 years later, two scientists, Gustav Kirchhoff and Robert Bunsen, made a revolutionary discovery about these lines using Bunsen's new invention, the Bunsen burner. By burning different elements, Kirchhoff and Bunsen discovered that each one had a unique collection of dark lines a unique spectrum. They also worked out that this spectrum was due to elements absorbing light, but only at specific wavelengths. And what's more, some of the elements' lines matched the lines that came from sunlight. The sun spectrum was composed of the spectrums of other elements. For instance, the two lines that Fraunhofer labeled D1 and D2 were in the yellow region of the solar spectrum, and they also appeared in the spectrum of sodium. So Bunsen and Kirchhoff concluded that the D lines from the sunlight must have been caused by small amounts of sodium in the sun. And they were right. Once they realized they could identify elements in the sun using spectroscopy, other scientists got to work studying the solar spectrum, looking for more lines that Fraunhofer missed. There are lots of solar spectrum lines, but one line would soon stand out. In 1868, two researchers independently studied a solar eclipse. The eclipse blocked light from the main part of the sun, allowing them to get a clear spectrum from the sun's outermost layer, the corona. From this, they both detected a line near the two well-known sodium D lines 
called D3. One of these researchers later realized that the line wasn't from sodium or from any known element. And so he made the bold claim that it must have been from an unknown element. He named it helium after Helios, the Greek sun god. He just discovered a new element without ever getting his hands on the stuff. For a while, this discovery was controversial. How could you detect an element without a sample? Besides, Mendeleev's periodic table had no room for a new element like this. Some said the new line was just a hydrogen line that they'd previously missed. Because helium is so rare and unreactive, it was hard to isolate a sample. Eventually, in 1895, a chemist at University College London isolated an element formed in the radioactive decay of uranium. This element had the distinctive D3 line, so he concluded it had to be helium. He was actually looking for a different noble gas, argon, at the time, which he eventually found. After the discovery of helium and argon, Mendeleev was convinced to add the two noble gases to a new grouping on his periodic table. All these discoveries were made before scientists knew why spectrums work this way. The answer turns out to be our old friend, quantum mechanics. We now know that atoms can only absorb and emit particles of light, aka photons, if those photons are at certain specific wavelengths. The precise wavelengths are unique to each type of atom, so every atom has a different spectrum that can be used to identify it. During the eclipse, researchers were seeing helium atoms in the sun's outer layer absorbing light emitted from the lower layers, and the absorption was happening only at distinct wavelengths. Today, we can use spectroscopy to learn about the composition of all kinds of things we wouldn't know much about otherwise. In some ways, we have more information about the composition of distant galaxies than about the stuff in the core of our own planet. Telescopes are also starting to be advanced enough for us to use spectroscopy to study the atmospheres of planets orbiting other stars. Maybe we've found all the natural elements, but we've barely scratched the surface of what we can learn with spectroscopy. It might seem impossible back then to discover an element without a sample of it, but spectroscopy is just that good. A lot of these impossible things only became possible after new technology was developed to observe them. So the things that are technically impossible today might just be waiting for new technology to detect them better. Take white holes, for example. White holes are a hypothetical opposite to the black hole. Instead of sucking in matter, they spew it outward. With our current technology, we know that time can only go in one direction. So white holes are definitely impossible, unless we've seen one already. Here's Reed to tell us more. In theory, white holes are black holes that are going backwards. In theory. A black hole, as you know, is a giant object that sucks stuff in to a singularity. A single point of infinite density from which there is no escape. So a white hole would be an object that expels matter from a singularity, and you'd never be able to enter it. White holes only exist in math, but in 2006 we saw an explosion of light out in deep space that we can't explain any other way. It's even weirder than it sounds. In reality, a white hole would violate the second law of thermodynamics. This says that the amount of entropy in the universe can only stay the same or increase. It can never decrease. Entropy is often described as disorder, but it's more like a measure of how many different states that particles in a system can be in at a given moment. Like if you have a piano and you throw it in a wood chipper, you've increased the entropy of the piano. Because a pile of chopped up piano splinters can be in lots and lots of different configurations while still being a pile of splinters. But these piano splinters can really only be in one very specific state in order to be a piano. At least a piano that works. So black holes are great at increasing entropy. They're the universe's wood chippers, shredding entire stars into pulp and leaving only a whiff of radiation. But you can't load a pile of piano splinters into a wood chipper and run the thing backwards to get a piano again. That would decrease entropy, which is not allowed. And if white holes existed, that's essentially what they do. So why does anyone think white holes might exist in the first place? Well, they were first proposed as a kind of mathematical oddity because of Einstein's theories of relativity. One of the many endearing quirks of relativity is that it doesn't care whether you play time backward or forward. If time can go in one direction, it can just as easily go in the other. So if black holes are a thing, then white holes, which are black holes played backward, can also be a thing. But just because relativity says time can go in both directions, 
In practice, it pretty much sticks to one, as we all know. So, even if a white hole did somehow occur, it would be incredibly unstable. Because the universe does not like it when you break the laws of physics. So a real white hole would probably only exist for a few seconds before it collapsed in on itself and became a black hole. Which brings us back to the explosion we saw in 2006. Detected by NASA's SWIFT satellite on June 14th, it was a huge gamma ray burst. The highest energy type of explosion possible. A million trillion times more energetic than the sun. And it lasted for... 102 seconds. Scientists believe that gamma ray bursts only last that long during supernovas. But this one, labeled GRB 060614, didn't have a supernova to go with it. As far as we can tell, it was an explosion of white hot light that came from nowhere and then vanished. And while white holes remain incredibly, stupendously, ridiculously unlikely, that's pretty much exactly what we think one would look like. Some physicists have offered other explanations for what it might have been, like a shockwave from a neutron star torn apart by a black hole, or maybe two neutron stars colliding. But events like these only release energy for two seconds at most, not a minute and a half. So, white holes in nature are as impossible as a thing can be, while still being technically possible. But they are technically possible. And until we see another explosion like the one in 2006 that we could hopefully learn more from, we'll just have to wait and wonder. All right, so it's still a theory for now. But maybe nothing is truly impossible. We just haven't figured it out yet. Thanks for watching this SciShow Space compilation. For more impossible space science, you can watch our old news episode about a propulsion system that doesn't use propellant.